spending time daily in our devotions and even weekly on the Lord's Day with the Lord. Get along with Him the Word, with prayer and praise, drinking Him in and hiding in the shadow of the Almighty. And then last week, we looked at the power of parents in the life of Job, chapter 1, where he was the priest of his family, and he interceded for them, and he went up before the Lord for them, and he led them in a good way and was a good model to them. And continuing on and just trying to get going for the year, putting us in a good place, we're going to be looking at being strong in the Lord, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. And this is what it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. <clears throat> Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. And I want you to notice how it's repeated, that word stand. Stand firm, then, verse 14, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And then Paul gets very personal. He says, Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me, that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, and pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. <clears throat> you know, I'm a big student of history, and I love military history. I've mentioned that before. And, and Marvin shared in the last men's prayer breakfast a great devotion from the USS Indianapolis a story of a battleship in World War II and did a great job of that. And I'm a big fan of World War II history. And, and one particular one is, is the Battle of D-Day. Five beaches, millions and billions of moving parts. And all the things that had to go in together to make this the largest invasion in human history and the largest defense in human history that has ever occurred even to the current day. One particular beach out of the five beaches, you had Gold, Sword, Omaha, all those. One was Omaha Beach, and the United States was in charge of that one on D-Day, June 6, 1944. <clears throat> on that particular day, they had planned to insert 4,000 I'm sorry, 34,000 men and their equipment, a few hundred million tons of equipment onto the beach, move inward to where paratroopers had dropped further in to Normandy in France, and then join up with them and push on towards Berlin. And so you had all these groups coming in, all these different beaches, but this particular one, Omaha, everything that was supposed to go right went wrong. That day was supposed to be clear. The forecast was great. It was rainy, it was cloudy, it was soupy, it was foggy. It was horrible. The waves are supposed to be clear for landing craft to go in with all these men, drop their doors, men rush the beaches. It was high tide, turbulence, lots of waves, a lot of white caps. The men were supposed to be able to have natural avenues where they could cut through the barbed wire and those things and get on the beach quickly. Instead, where they thought there would be draws to do that were actually the most heavily fortified within the water and out on the beach. When they thought they would run into lights of mounts of uh, you know, resistance from the Germans, they actually had huge concrete pillboxes, as they called them, with large amounts of artillery and machine gun fire that would pin our guys down and just hammer them. So on that day, we had... 4,740 men die within a span of four hours. Most of that equipment never made it on the beach. Most of the things that they planned did not happen. It was an absolute nightmare, that battle. It was deemed by most military planners as highly unsuccessful. Now, as you know, the history of World War II, we were successful getting to Berlin. But on that particular beach... It was now called Bloody Omaha. That is what it's now 
called in the history books. And that was basically because everything that we thought we were going to run into, the schemes that the Germans were going to have in defense, were wrong. And we were not prepared for what they had. And so we ended up being bogged down and just hammered on that particular day. It was a rough, rough thing. What we see in the passage before us this morning is the same kind of thing. We see Paul telling us, after he's talked to us about the main verse of Ephesians being Ephesians 4.1, live worthy of the calling that you've received to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Live in a manner that shows yourself to be a disciple of his, that glorifies God. That's the main verse of this, of this book. And he goes on to say, do this for your family. Husbands and wives, love each other, respect each other, submit to each other. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Fathers, don't be angry. Don't cause bitterness in your kids. Be loving and kind to them, but discipline them in the Lord. Masters, be kind to your slaves. Slaves, obey your masters. Love each other in the Lord. And he goes on to talk about all these ways to, to do that. And then at the end of the book, he draws up and changes the whole sound of Ephesians. And he finishes this up with this discussion of spiritual warfare. Do not be ignorant of the devil's schemes, Paul says. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand our struggle, this idea of fighting against the devil and his, his minions. Paul jumps into, and you kind of ask yourself, why is that? Why is it that at the close of Ephesians, suddenly Paul moves in this direction? And that is because Paul knows that all the things that he's unpacked in Ephesians, <clears throat> our calling before the Lord, our election, our predestination, God loving us and dying on the cross for us and empowering us and being spirit-filled and, and the way to live as families and all these things, he wraps it up by saying, guess what? When you try to live this life that's worthy of the calling you've received, it's not going to go unnoticed. Somebody out there is going to be paying attention and he's not your friend. The devil is sticking around and he's watching you and he's got schemes against you. And so Paul's going to admonish us. He's going to teach us in this passage four big things I want you to see. The big idea is to be strong in the Lord, to stand. Okay, that's a big idea. But these four things is first the, the source of this strength. Second is the, why we have a need for this strength. The third thing is the nature of this strength. And finally, the outcome of us standing in this strength in the Lord. Okay? Remember, our purpose is to glorify God, to live a life worthy of the calling you've received, Verses, chapter 4, verse 1. And so this is what we're going to look at, the source of our strength. Uh, uh, verse 10 and 11, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. Be strong, right? That's a command, that's an imperative. God is telling us in a strong way that we are what? If he's telling us to be strong, does, is the implication that we're strong on our own? No, the implication is quite the opposite. The implication is you guys are weak. You can't stand against the devil on your own. Therefore, the command is be strong. It's an imperative. Be strong in the Lord. You need somebody else's strength, another source for your strength. Colossians 1.11 puts it this way. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, God's might. God doesn't mince his words. We are weak and we need to put on Christ. We need his strength. We need the power of his strength. And then it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, right? That idea of almighty God that we see in the Old Testament. He has all the power. He has all the might. 345 times it's used in the text to describe God's name, right? Almighty. God is almighty. Job 37, 23. The almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in his power. God has power. We need to be strong in that source of power. Now, when I was thinking about analogies for strength, there's a lot out there. But the one that kind of stuck to my head was, was a guy I knew in the Springs. That, he's still around. My brother just spent part of New Year's Eve with him called Big Mike. So Big Mike's not as tall as me. I'm 6'2". Big Mike's about 5'10". Okay? Big Mike's exactly what it says. He's a big guy. Big Mike. So we were one time helping out. A group of us guys had a men's Bible study that met at my house for, for about nine years. And uh, we were over helping this gal that had gone through a divorce and doing some stuff for her at her house. And 
she had all this landscaping to do. And so we showed up for the day, actually for two days, and we're just doing all this landscaping for. Well, she had this series of boulders at the edge of her property that she wanted moved over to where the property line changed out in the country. So we were moving those boulders. You know, two or three of us grabbed these boulders, heaved them, rolled them into these, these big you know, wheelbarrows and moved them along and sometimes used a tractor and things. This one particular boulder was, was about the size of that piano, it seemed. It wasn't quite, but it was huge. And me and Scott got on that, my brother. We grabbed that thing. I was in my prime. I was only 26 at the time, man. Picking that thing up. We heaved and we hoed and all of us were gym rats at the time and we were jerking on that thing and guess what? We lifted it a whole nothing. <laughs> Didn't even roll it on the ground. Okay, and we kept messing with this thing, put, put picks and shovels in it and trying to lift and pry and a big old pry bar, big old huge pry bars. We just cannot lift this thing. Big Mike standing over there working on the other side watching us. Pretty soon he gets a big scowl on his face. Pretty soon that scowl turns into a frown. He says, get out of there. Comes over there, picks that rock up, reaches down, picks that thing up like Scottish games, man. Roll that up on his knees and kind of duck walk that big thing over. Set that down. And he walked off. Well, the rest of us all knew who had bragging rights like forever. Okay, Big Mike. I mean, he was strong. He was like an ox, man. This guy, guy played ball, and he power lifted. And on that particular day, we learned the value of somebody else's strength. What we could not accomplish on our own, Big Mike did in his strength. He was the source of strength. So in numerous things that we did for people after that, whenever something big and heavy, guess who we call on? Big Mike, okay? Well, Jesus is our Big Mike. We can't move the sins of our life out on our own. We can't keep the devil at bay on our own. But Jesus is our source of strength. He is our big Mike that moves in. And with his strength and his power, he shores us up so that we can stand against the devil and his schemes. You know, when we look at Revelation 19, which I've mentioned here a number of times, you know, Jesus returns... Petra's got a great song about this that my son and I sing often in private. You don't want to hear us sing it. He's good. I'm not, okay? So the privacy of our home, we sing that. You know, in the great white horse, the king will come riding, the one they call faithful and true, with eyes of fire and blood-stained clothing. He had a name that nobody else knew. And by his side ride the armies of heaven. And it goes on and on and on. In that great battle of Armageddon, it says... At the end of chapter 20, or at the beginning of it, in Revelation, in the next chapter, that God binds the beast and the devil and the false prophet and throws them into the lake of fire where they will be tormented and bound forever and ever. So we know the end story as believers. We know that we win, that Jesus wins, our side wins. But in the meantime, we have to stand against the devil. We've got to turn to Jesus Christ. He is our great knight that kind of defends us. He is our King Arthur. He is our big Mike. He is our protection and our strength. He's the one that we look to. So how do we appropriate this truth of being strong in the Lord? How do we do that? How do we drink deep from God to be strong in the Lord and to put on that full armor of God? How do we do that? We've been talking about that. Getting alone. In fact, in Sunday school, we were talking about that in the real life. Getting alone with God daily. Coming together, getting alone from the world as the church. Gathering in here once a week, twice a week, to drink deep from the Lord. To hear the Spirit speak through each other. When we get together for potluck soon, let's make this a short sermon, right? Good potluck, Broncos. When we get together soon, have some great food and fellowship, it's the Spirit speaking through you guys, edifying and building me up and vice versa. When we gather around the text of God, the Word of God that has power, and we are teaching it and preaching it and studying it, it's building us up. When we pray together collectively as the church, and we're drinking from the Spirit of God and His power, we are in the strength and power of the Lord. We are in Christ. And His victory at the cross and at the end of time is certain and true. 
Let's look at verses 11 and 12. The need for a strength that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, right? Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil that are in the heavenly realms. We need to be able to know what the schemes of the devil are, right? Because James 4.7 tells us that we are to do exactly this, that we are to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Now what does that look like? Because I've been around a lot of stuff. Okay, I've been around a lot of stuff over the years. You know, casting out territorial spirits, marking off places that this is where Jesus is at and you guys are out there, exorcisms of people, all craziness. I mean, I'm talking craziness. The only thing I was waiting for next was the snake handling. And I was out of there. Right? I mean, there's been craziness. So what does he mean by a standing against the schemes? This schemes, this Greek word schemes means the wiles, the, the plots, the methods of the devil. He's intelligent. Second Corinthians tells us in chapter 11 that the devil, Satan, appears as an angel of light. He doesn't come at us frontwards showing how ugly and nasty he is and how wicked his stuff is and how it's going to be a bad ending for us. He comes at us looking good. He comes at us looking right, looking just like Jesus with enough of a deviation that when you follow him, you're out in no man's land, right? And if you guys have been hunting, know that when you follow map and compass, you better be dead on, right? How many of you want your GPS to be off by 5 degrees over 10 miles when you're hunting, right? No, I'm going to end up on the wrong mountain. My truck's not there. I'm there. I'm going to spend the night there, right? That's what the devil does. He, he deviates it some. And it says that we wrestle. This idea of those Roman wrestlers in the Colosseum close hand-to-hand, -hand, intimate conflict that were in the games of that day that were popular, kind of like the football games that we watch today. Do you think football is a nice, cute little sport where everybody's nice to each other? I promise you in the, in the trenches there, punching each other in the throat, gouging each other's eyes, pinching each other, smacking each other. That goes on all the time. It's a battle. It's a struggle. And we have to deal with the devil, right? But in our case, it's something spiritual. It's not physical. He doesn't come at us physically. And he can't affect us physically. It's something spiritual. And you know what I've seen in my time working for the Lord and, and being a believer on this earth is is people kind of do three things with the devil and his minions, the demons. Either they don't give them enough credit, and they say they have no power and they can't do anything, or they give him too much credit, and he can attack us, kill us, do all these horrible things that he can't do, or they don't believe he even exists at all. And in our culture, in our nation, and in the Western civilization, option number three is the most common. That you talk to people about spiritual things, and they don't even believe that there's an evil entity. They don't believe that Satan is literally a person, meaning a personality that exists. So when the Pew Research did its research of, of Christians, evangelical Christians, people who identified themselves as evangelical Christians in the United States, a survey of 4,000 people across the United States, men, women, cross-section, all that, what percentage do you think of those people believe that Satan was a literal personality? Take a guess. Throw it out. Someone's close. 17. That's of us, the church, the followers of Christ. But the Bible says that we have a struggle, that there is a devil, and that he has schemes to get us. That he exists and he's real. Right? We must resist him. And then he will flee from us. Right? This is nothing that we can ignore. We cannot ignore him. He is serious. He is real. Now, in our culture, we've often done this. In the United States, when World War II was breaking out all over the globe, we just talked about that, what did we do? Did we join the fight against the Japanese or the Germans? No. We hung out. We are over here. We're fine. We're great. And then a small little chunk of water called Pearl Harbor changed all that, right? Then all of a sudden, we threw in eight and a half million men and tons of women and got it done, right? Joined the Brits and the French and everybody else. 
then you'd think we'd learn from that. But there's another thing called this war on terrorism that was started in the late 90s. Someone had already tried to bomb the World Trade Center with a van, if you remember, that was underneath the garage. That same group, that network, had, had attacked the USS Cole, a destroyer killing 17 of our Navy men. And what did we do during that time? We sat on the sidelines again. And then this small act called 9-11, bringing down two towers and 4,000 people dying, gets us into the last 12-year war on terror, which our men and women have fought bravely and are winning and doing a great job. But we cannot do that as individuals, as the church of Jesus Christ. We have to understand that the devil is real. He has schemes. So how does he do it? What does he do to us? Well, the scripture tells us a number of those things. First, he, he causes us to doubt. Right? Back all the way back in Genesis 3, you got the serpent showing up. Adam and Eve are perfect in the garden. They got all this. Be fruitful and multiply. Work the land. Enjoy it. Chapter 2. Chapter 3, the very next chapter, everything's perfect. And you see this, this evil being in the form of a serpent show up. And he talks. When's the last time you saw a snake talk? If he does, I'm going to be scared, right? But this snake, because he was the devil, talked. And Revelation 20 identifies him as that ancient serpent, the dragon, Satan, the devil. It calls him out. And he says to Eve, and then, by implication to Adam too, did God say, did God really say that you can't eat of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil? You know, he didn't come right here and say, God is wrong. Don't do what God says. Do what I say. He didn't do that. He came at her with just a, a sliver of doubt. Did God really say that? And tricked the first man and woman into that, and we've borne the fruit of sin ever since. Doubt. He gives us just enough. Did God really say that you cannot do this? Did God really say that you should do that? Maybe, maybe he meant just, just a little bit different than that. And he inserts enough doubt into our thinking that we get off course. What about distortion of the good, right? Satan doesn't have evil. Evil is not a thing. Evil is the absence of good. He distorts the good, right? Food is good. It is a great thing that God's given us. You can eat every tree in the garden, just not that one in the middle. Food is great. But gluttony is a sin. Drink is great. But drunkenness, a distortion of the good, is sin. Sex is great. But variations and deviant ones from that are distortions of the good. Marriage is great. But polygamy and other distortions are evil. God gives us the good, and Satan slightly distorts it enough that we make them idols before God. What about discouragement, right? Discouragement. He comes at us, things are tough in our life, and he basically sits here like in the book of Job and says, God's not on your side. He's not there for you. He doesn't care about you. Look at how he's allowing you to suffer. Look at how you're hurting. He doesn't love you. You're on your own. Discouragement, right? Because adversity, Jesus taught us in the parable of the soils in Matthew, adversity weeds out a lot of people. The cares of this life, the worries of this life, make a lot of people run away from Christ. What about temptation, right? This is the third D. He dazzles us. Yeah, he distorts. He causes doubt and discouragement, but he dazzles us. Right? How many of you are fishermen? There's some good fishermen in this group, isn't there? Some good fishermen. I'm horrible. I'm horrible fishing. I've told you that. But I've heard that certain lures are the thing. And so the really good fishermen will say, Greg, I know you're bad at it, but it's really not about you. It's really, it's really this lure. If you will try this lure for this fish in this pond, and they hold it up, and it's almost like they got a piece of gold. You know, they hold it up and they say, the cat's shiny. The cat wiggles. Look at it in the water. The fish are going to love it. And it lures you in, right? It lures the fish in with that shininess, that wiggliness. It looks yummy. Whatever they're thinking. Little fish brains, right? Well, we're no different than those stupid fish. 
Things in the world look good. That looks great. I don't need a piece of pie. I want the whole pie, man. That looks awesome. That's too many calories, too much sugar. It'll make me diabetic, right? I don't want a little bit of this. I want all of it. That looks kind of good. If I just if I try a little bit of that and nobody knows about it, I'll be just fine. I can. Here's the great lie. I can handle it. No, we can't. That's why Jesus says in this text, right? Paul says, stand strong in the Lord in his mighty power. We can't handle it. James puts it this way, that we are drawn away and enticed by the own evil desires within us. Sin within us draws us away and entices us. That idea of luring us in with that temptation. And Jesus says it this way, no temptation has seized you, but what is common to all people. And he will provide a way of escape for you so that you can withstand under it. Corinthians 10, 13. Dazzle. And last, the fifth D is division. Jesus was very clear that a house divided against itself cannot what? Cannot stand. That's the great strength of this church, Calvary Baptist Church, is how these people, you as a family, love each other and are strong and forgiving and understanding of each other. Having lived through a number of church splits in other churches, it is a welcome relief. It is a great thing. Division. What about between husband and wife in the household? Division. Brothers and sisters. Sibling rivalry, is that real? It's real. How many moms and dads out there would say sibling rivalry is real? It's real. You ever seen brothers and sisters go at each other? You'd think if you weren't in the same family, you're going to kill each other. Us four brothers, we fought like cats and dogs. Sibling rivalry is real. And I'm sure we've seen each other or experienced ourselves fighting within our own marriages. Division is real. These are his schemes. Doubt, distortion, discouragement, dazzling you. Division. That's how he says. But what does it say? Put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 11. We've got to know what those schemes are to beat them. To know what we're going to do. And these authorities, rulers, these cosmic powers of darkness, these forces, some people will teach you that, that there's this ranking of demons and some are higher and some are lower and all that. And guess what? The Greek does not support that at all. It's just Paul is using a lot of repetition of different words to tell us there's baddies out there. They're there. He's not calling them different things. He's just saying there's a lot of them and they're there. And we have to take a stand against them. There's no ranking of the evil forces. There's Satan and his minions. And they're going to lose. God's already won the victory. But we cannot withstand the Satan's enemies' kind of schemes unless we draw near to the Lord day after day in that secret place. Draw near to God, James 4, 8 says, and he will draw near to you. First Samuel teaches us if you honor God, he will honor you. Those are foundational principles. Galatians says you reap what you sow. If you sow to the Spirit of God... You will be godly. If you sow to the flesh, you'll become evil. And there's a constant battle going on. Next, the nature of our strength. We've looked at the source of our strength, right? Now the nature of our strength. Verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. There it is again, standing. Not attacking, not going after them, not driving out territorial spirits, but just standing, withstanding the attack. Right? And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. Belt of truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Feet of the gospel of peace. In addition, take up the shield of faith. Right? And the helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit. There's a lot of things there. You get this idea. And, and when Paul wrote this, most scholars think that he was under house arrest. And more than likely at that time, he was within a distance of one of the Roman centurions, maybe even chained to one, possibly. We don't know. But he certainly was around him and saw him. And you would see this Penelope that they have of all this, this great armor. I mean, the, war, the warriors that the Romans were were fierce. They were the best in the world. They made the Assyrians and the Babylonians before them look like Swiss cheese. They were fierce warriors. Remember the Spartans would start their boys out at seven, the great Greek Spartans, and train them to be warriors. But the Romans knuckled the Greeks under. 
They were powerful. They were amazing. And Paul's looking at this, and he's not saying literally there's something you got to put on here and there in any of your body. He's using it as a metaphor that like all this armor protects these soldiers and makes them powerful, these things in your life, these characteristics of Jesus Christ, do the same thing for you. Put on the whole armor of God. Are we allowed to miss out on some of it? Are we allowed to miss out on some of it? This is the whole armor, right? If a guy grabs his sword and all his armor and stuff and forgets his shield and runs out, the archer's going to pick him off, isn't he? He's going to hammer him from a distance, right? You've got to have the whole armor of God. Righteousness is the idea. And what Paul is thinking back, remember Paul was a trained Pharisee. He's thinking back to the book of Isaiah chapter 11 where it describes Jesus intervening for his peace, his people for peace in Jerusalem. And he's girded with this belt of righteousness and this sash of truth. And, and he goes through all these things. And so Paul's using that same kind of metaphor. It's God's provision, not ours. We need all of it, not some of it. And we're to put it on. It needs to be an intentional, purposeful, by design, not on accident kind of thing that we do. And what is important is not a specific correspondence between a piece of armor and a part of our life, but rather that we are taken upon all these characteristics in our character of Jesus Christ. Remember, the main verse is to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Chapter 4, verse 1. So we're to be conformed to the image of Christ. Another passage in Romans says, put on the armor of light. Paul often says, put on these characteristics of Christ and put off these sins of the flesh. And that's what he's putting in another way here. He's saying that we need to have these things as part of our life as believers. The whole armor of God. We need all of it so that we can stand and survive. If you've talked to modern day soldiers of the United States military, they will say there's two things that research says in their experience of why they have a lower casualty rate now than any other war. One, and number one, is medical advancements. Vacuum packs in the field, certain kind of tourniquets, more advanced stuff in the field. Quicker airlifts out. Better surgical hospitals, what used to be called mass units, right there in the field. But two is body armor. The improvements, improvements, improvements in body armor. They still get hit, but they have things that protect them so that they can stand against the enemy. So let's look at the specifics, these characteristics of Christ. The belt of truth. It's interesting that Paul lists this first, right? That truth is what transforms our lives. When we, earlier in the book, Ephesians says, speak the truth in love, right? Then it tells us to speak the truth to one another with hymns and songs and spiritual songs. That we are to speak the truth to one another. That we're to believe in the truth, right? Doesn't that include your wife, your boss, your friend, your coworker, your subordinate, your kids, each other's believers? When we speak the truth to one another, what does it do? It promotes unity. It gives us openness, transparency before one another. We become real with each other. And the eternal truths of Scripture, which have power, which are cosmically true, we are inserting into each other's lives. The belt of truth. What about the breastplate of righteousness? Right? Being good. Having God's righteousness. Paul often says in chapter 4 of Ephesians, put away greed and stealing and sexual immorality and any kind of impurity and anger and malice and vices and slander and let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth. We put on righteousness by putting off the sins of the flesh. What about feet ready with the gospel of peace? Boldly and clearly, Paul says at the end of this passage in verses 19 and 20, pray for me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. He's probably not far from dying, which we read about in 2 Timothy, coming on. The, coming on. And what does Paul want to do? I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The answer for humanity's problems is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we are ready to share the gospel of what? The gospel of peace. The gospel brings peace between people. 
I know that you're not so bad. You know why? Because I now know through the gospel my own wretchedness. You don't look so bad when I've looked in the mirror at my own evil. I can't judge you because i got too much to look at on myself. It produces peace between us. Right? When husbands and wives are spending more time trying to obey Jesus Christ and love and respect each other, they put away their arguments and it brings peace in their marriage. In their families, peace the same way. When we give up being rivals to each other and who's better and who's less, and instead we were centered around the gospel, it brings peace in families. And in entire cultures, it's the same way. Wherever the gospel has gone, there's been peace. If you look at the Western world, all throughout not just the United States, but Britain and Europe and all those things, wherever the gospel has gone, guess what? Women have had the most rights to work and to vote and to be treated fairly, not as property. Children have been given rights too, to be treated humanely, to not be worked as slaves, to not be owned as property, to get an education, and to be cared for and loved. Animals, the humane society, those began on Christian principles, that you can't beat your dog and you can't whip down your cat, or whatever animal you got, but you have to treat them in humane ways. The gospel brings peace in our world. What about the shield of faith? It's this confident hope and belief in God's promises, His power, that what He says is reality. And when we have faith in Jesus Christ, that what He says is true, when the devil tries to come at us with those five Ds, guess what it does? It extinguishes that, right? It stops it. The devil tries to feed you a lie, and you say, no. Isn't that what Jesus did? The devil fed him a lie in the desert? You are starving. Turn these stones to bread. And he used Scripture. Twist into distorting. And Jesus corrected the use of Scripture. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Three times that happened. And God always came back to the Word of God to correct the devil. The shield of faith. Jesus trusted the benevolence and love of the Almighty Father, and we should do the same, regardless of our circumstances. And it extinguishes His power in our lives. What about the helmet of salvation? It's also found in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. It means that we are in Christ. Romans 6 says that we are baptized into Christ and that we are new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if you are in Christ, that salvation experience that we have, becoming part, being in Christ, being in union with Christ, that the old is gone and the new has come, that we are new creations in Christ. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Jesus used it against the devil. We should also. Hebrews 4.12 says it's living and active. It divides soul and spirit. It discerns our thoughts and our intentions and our heart. Dividing us just like a sword divides a body. Psalm 19 says, Who can discern his errors? Keep your servant from willful sins. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be pleased in your sight, O Lord God, my my Redeemer. But earlier it talks about the power of God's Word and its purity and what it can do in our lives. It's the sword that we use to take captive all thoughts to the obedience of Christ. And then it goes on to say, pray in the Spirit, right? Verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the saints. In the Greek, basically that request, prayers, all that, it's the same thing. It occurs four times. Why is that there? Why is that there four times in one, two sentences? Because Paul is emphasizing the power of prayer in our lives. That when we pray on all occasions for whatever it is, that the power of God is enacted in our lives. We pray for each other when? At all times. What kind of prayers? All kinds of prayers, right? All kinds of requests. How? What does it say? It says keep on praying, right? Keep on praying. Keep alert and always keep praying. This idea of perseverance. And finally, what does it say? Praying for all the saints. Interceding for one another. There is power in prayer. Not your power and mine, because we have none. But Jesus' power. When we obey Him and we pray for one another, God's power is at work in our lives. It happens all the time. You know, I saw a sign on a church 
when I went to Denver this week on the way back, it's very interesting. It was a Mennonite church, a little church in Eagle. And what it said was, I think it was Mennonite. I think that's what it said. But what it said was, where have you seen God at work today? I love that sign. I was like, yeah, these guys are proactive. They're telling people God is at work. Where have you seen him at work today? And that's what prayer is about. We know God's at work. We're joining his work and blessing other people by praying and interceding for them. How many of you have felt God lift you up in some manner spiritually and then found out later that someone was praying for you about that? It's real. God does heal people physically and spiritually all the time. We need to be praying in the Spirit, right? The, the armor of God is our source of strength when we put on the characteristics of Christ. And then the outcome, verses 12, 13, and 14. Multiple times it says, stand, right? Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when the devil comes at you, you may be able to stand your ground and when everything's over, to stand, right? And then it starts, stand firm then. And it tells you all this stuff, right? To stand. We're not on the offense. We don't go after the devil. What kind of nonsense is that? The Bible doesn't say that anywhere, that we're supposed to go after him. Exercise, cast out, all this stuff. It doesn't say that. And if it's not in the text, we shouldn't be doing that. It says to stand. And when the outcome's done, when the battle is over, it says, what happens? You're still standing firm. When we persevere in our faith, when we have these characteristics of Christ, when the evil day comes, and for all of us we've had the evil day, right? And if you haven't yet, you're going to. I've said that to you before. Don't want a pastor that lies to you. You're going to have an evil day. And when they come, we need to stand. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, that, that if we think that we're strong, that we're standing, be careful, for we may fall. So when we put on the full armor of God, the characteristics of Christ, and we're walking with the Lord, and we're in step with the Spirit, we're Spirit-filled, and we're doing all these things, we need to be careful that we don't sidestep, that we give up doing the good things that the Lord wants us to do, the daily disciplines of the faith. Because then we may fall. Jesus stood in the moments of trial and assault by Satan. We talked about that. But then you move from the forward of his ministry to the middle of his ministry. Remember him casting out... Remember him talking to Satan through Peter? He said, I'm going to the cross, guys. This is going to happen. And Peter, his number one guy, says, Oh, no, Lord. No way. You'll never have to go. And Jesus turns around and says, Get out of here, Satan. Get behind me. Uh, this is the Father's plan. I'm going to do this. That's not casting out thing. He's saying it doesn't matter what you oppose. God's will is going to be done. And then at the end of his life, before he goes to the cross... Can you imagine the pressure he felt from evil? And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he takes his closest three friends, and he says, watch and pray, intercede for me, be there for me, I need it, this is the dark hour. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prays with such stress in himself that blood runs down his neck. And believe me, that's a real thing. When I used to power lift, I'd see guys deadlift, weight that they couldn't lift, and they would struggle so hard and so long that the blood vessels would open up from the pressure and push the blood out through their neck. And sometimes they would pass out right after that. Happened to me one time. Smelling salts abound. Woo! Wake up. Right? Jesus is under so much stress in the Garden of Gethsemane that it, that's the kind of pressure within. As he struggles against evil and he tries to do the will of the Father. But he does it, and he stands, and he goes to the cross, and he redeems you and I. We need to have that same strength to stand. Because the outcome is that we will survive, and we will be fine, and we will have victory. We know who has the say. The end of the day, Jesus wins. He wins today, he wins tomorrow, and at the end he wins. I just got to stick with him. right? He's the super soldier that never goes down. He's the Captain America, so to speak. If you're next to him, you're not going to go down. We've got to stand with him and be with him. So how do we stand? Let's just get practical about this. First, we need to renew our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Don't be 
pressured or pushed into the mold of the world. Don't be conformed to the way this world lives, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll know what the will of God is. Be transformed by the will, knowing of what God wants us to do. Scripture meditation and memorization, right? Taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Second, let's reckon, okay? First, we renew our minds so that we don't believe all the lies and doubts and distortions of the devil. But then, what do we do? We count ourselves dead to sin. Remember, we're alive to God. We're new in Christ. In Romans 6, that whole passage, the first 14 verses tells us that we're in union with Christ and that we've died to our old way of life, that we've been raised to a new way of life, that if He was resurrected, we will be resurrected, that if He has overcome sin and death, we will overcome sin and death. And then it says in verse 11, reckon in the old Bibles. I love that one. Reckon. I get visions of tombstone. I reckon he's going to get him. Reckon. In other words, count it. Consider it absolutely true. Count yourselves dead to sin, alive in Christ. Romans 6.11 we have to tell ourselves the truth day in and day out. Daily, sometimes moment by moment, remind ourselves that we are dead to sin's power. When we are tempted, we don't have to do it. When we're led astray, we don't have to do it. You know, I used to work with substance abusing individuals. Wonderful people. I love them. But I remember sometimes these young guys would come back from the weekend. and We'd have group. These guys were also offenders. Okay, so they were doing time. Department of Youth Corrections at the time. They'd say, Greg, I tried this, but I couldn't stand it. I just couldn't say no. Yeah, you can. You can say no. It doesn't feel like it. Your experience doesn't say you can, but you can. In God's power, you can. And when they would start having victories to say no, it was like it was the difference. You know what? That thing you told me, that strategy, I tried that. I didn't go over to so-and-so's house, or I wasn't near that bar, or I didn't go, you know, and that worked, man. Fancy that? Why don't you try that again this weekend when you're out? And they come in, and then you see a few, just a few of those guys, transform their lives completely. Many of them with Christ, most of them. They transform their lives, and they say, man, I can't believe that, that I thought that way, that I acted that way, and that I didn't think I had any control over that. Because they see a difference. A friend of mine who did 16 years of hard time here in Colorado, tried to kill a man, did a lot of methamphetamine trafficking, and a lot of other bad sins. Redeemed by Christ in prison. Sometimes those are false. It's just a game that those offenders play. Sometimes it's real. And with Carlos, it's real. Carlos has been out for seven years. He married a good Christian woman like 15, 20 years younger than him. I don't know what she was thinking, Sarah. But she's a godly woman. And he fell in love with her, and she with him. I did their premarital counseling. They got married. They have two wonderful kids now. He's been working for a church for four years. A church said, we don't care what your past is. We don't care what your felonies are. We trust you. Here's the keys. Clean, work, do this, that, and the other. And now he's their number one employee for a church of 7,000 on their custodial staff. The facilities guy. They're talking about making him one of their top guys. And he says, Greg, I don't know why I didn't find Christ earlier. And even when I knew Christ, I thought I was going to have to go back to my old way of life. But when I learned that I was truly a different man, and I thought about that all the time, that I didn't have to do what I used to do, that I had a new power within me of Christ, that was the difference. See, he'd learned to reckon himself dead to sin and alive to God. And I hope, I talked to him last week, I hope that Carlos can come one of these days with his wonderful family and share his testimony with you. That's what we were talking about. So I hope we can have him sometime. And next, resist. Resist. James 4, 7, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. We need to renew our minds. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin, alive to God, and we need to resist the devil. Pretty simple plan. Simple here. Not easy to do, right? Resist him. 
Don't fall for the schemes. You know what the schemes are going to be. Don't do them. Remember to stand in Christ. You know, I talked about body armor for for soldiers now. One of the guys, we, about 60% of our church, or where we used to be, Vista Grande, was military. Guys of all types, straights, you know, everything. Special ops guys, guys who are colonels, generals, everything in between. All branches. I used to joke that you could jump across the congregation on colonels' heads. There were so many of them, it seemed, especially Air Force guys. But you know, the Army guys and the Marine guys, I just, I don't know. Maybe it's being a brat. I just really was drawn to those guys. And one of them was, was Jim. Jim and his wife, Donya. Wonderful couple, been through a lot of things. She was in the Army too, part of the war on terror, got out after an injury, not in combat, but just an injury in training. But Jim had been in three tours in, in Iraq. And Jim had been to Mosul, he had been to Baghdad, and he had been to Sadr City. That's two of the three biggest battles in that war in Iraq. He did house clearing as an infantryman, striker forces, big guy. He was telling me, I said, how good is that body armor? Really? Not the news. You tell me. You've been there. You've been in the soup. How good is it? He said, well, let me tell you how good it is. We were doing house clearing one time. We had intel that this group had a little cell up in this fifth floor of this place in Baghdad, and me and a group of four guys were going in. Kicked in the door, flashbang, blah, blah, all the stuff you see on the movies, you know. They chose their quarters, sweep everything else. Nothing. There was nobody in that room. Intel was garbage. Didn't work. So they started walking out of the room, come around the corner. As they come around the corner, his buddy, the first guy around, point blank with an AK-47 with a guy right there. Three rounds to the chest. Dropped him about five feet back. Jim shot and killed that, that bad guy. Just lit him up. What do you think he did then? Well, after he shot the guy, what did he do? Oh, picked his buddy up. Just picked him up off the ground by the chest, right? By that whole vest. You all right, man? Pulled out the plate. A little ceramic plate right here. Pulled it out. Huge dents in it. His buddy's got these massive hematomas underneath his shirt when he cut it across. But no holes. No holes. No blood. I was able to get up and stand and walk out. Three days later, was involved in a big fight where he killed 15 guys and earned a bronze star for his heroism in battle. When it's all over, because of the armor that that man had, he was able to stand against the enemy. Real true. It's the same spiritually for us. When we put on the characteristics of Christ and walk close to him, and we understand the devil's schemes, and we're not caught off guard, we can stand in that evil day. That's a reality and truth for you and I. The devil is real. His minions are real. He does come after us. First Peter says he's like a roaring lion that runs around on the prowl looking at who he can devour. But this is the truth, though. He only can devour those who let him. He has no power. I used to tell my little girl, Sarah, out of the book of Job, Job 1 and 2, Satan can't do anything. He can't tie his shoes. I was putting it in kids' language. He can't tie his shoes without God's permission. It's true. Remember Satan coming before the Lord and asking what he could do with Job? God had to give him permission. We already have the battle won because Jesus has done all the work. We're just hanging out with him. He's our Captain America. We've got to stand strong in the Lord and be with Him. I hope that you'll look for those schemes, those five Ds. I hope that you'll renew your mind, reckon yourself dead to sin, alive to Christ, and resist the devil, and stay strong in your faith this year. All of us will have different temptations. All of us will have different things that come against us. All of us will have things in this world that can cut our legs out from underneath us. But when we walk strong with the Lord... He's the guy, the gym, that's picking us up and keeping us there. Be strong in the Lord. Let's pray.